welcome to Inner Voice of Knowing podcast. I'm Kay Doran, a shamanic leadership coach and healer, guiding you through life with a foot in both worlds. When you understand the terrain of the inner landscapes, the mental, emotional, spiritual, and energetic, you will become the leader within your physical life, both personally and professionally. After all, the power of change is in your hands. Let's get this journey started. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Inner Voice of Knowing. I've got a really wonderful guest on today. I was actually interviewed by Tara twice, so I'm going to introduce you to Tara Crete. And she is a guest co-host for Spiritually Raw, which is actually how we met. Uh, Mm -hmm. There were supposed to be others interviewing me, and I think it was the day before it changed. And I can see very clearly now why. And I love the fact, Tara, that you call yourself a spiritual adventurer because I think that's the way life needs to be and spirituality and growth needs to sort of be embraced as an adventure. And then you were kind enough to actually invite me onto your own fabulous podcast, which is called Sacred Valley Podcast, dedicated to uh, space for the great awakening, inviting listeners to expand their minds beyond the misinformation and mistruths that have pervaded our narratives for far too long. And I love the fact that there feels like this connectedness of our purpose in, you know, sort of removing those veils and 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 masks and and you know what's heart what's getting in the way of our living our greatest truth and having that spiritual adventure. So welcome Tara. Thank you so much, Kay. It's been, it's so nice. As soon as you and I connected on that first interview, we knew we were kindred spirits and very frequency specific to use a quantum word. So, so happy to be here. Yeah. And thank you because it's what, 7 a.m. your time, 8 p.m. my time, because you're over in Florida. And right? and I don't know a lot about you, Tara, because, you know, I've been the guest in your interview, yeah. so sort of the spotlight on me. But I knew I that, that there's way, been but... enough said by you because you two are a, are a life coach as as well as um, broadcaster, et cetera. And I think you have a yoga background as well. Is that correct? I'm teaching for a long time, practicing since 94, teaching since 98. Yes. Fantastic. Old yeah. yeah. But there was enough said in our conversations that I'm like, you, you are the real deal authentically um, inspired to continue to do the, you know, the tough stuff, to draw upon your courage, to to become more of your authentic self and to, you know, to work out what, what really is truth beyond all those false beliefs and stories. When did this start for you? Well, thank you for that. That's very kind of you to say. Um, you know, I kind of look at my life in two separate parts. The first yeah. part I kind of lived in the, in, I, I call it, I call them my ignorant years. I was just a very normal young girl, tomboy growing up, yeah. um, did everything society told me I should do as a, as a woman growing up in the eighties, you know, very strong, like, Oh, I can do everything myself. And uh, I still carry a little bit of that, but uh, <laughs> you no, know, by the age of like 28, I lived in a high rise apartment. It was gorgeous overlooking the city I grew up in. I had a boat, I had beautiful furnishings. I had, you know, all the things that I thought you were supposed to have to make you happy, but I didn't feel content. And um, I had what my brother calls today, a yard sale on my life. I'm from New Hampshire. So we had that like Boston yard sale. I had a yard sale on my life, I like, sold <laughs> everything. And I moved into this tiny little humble apartment and I just had like a big, big shift because that's where I stepped into my, my world of spirituality. That's where I really started to become a spiritual adventurer. So if you had told me that 25 years old, that I was going to be a spiritual adventurer, I would have said, oh, that sounds awesome, but there's no way. What an amazing place to find yourself in life really young. You know, when you're 25, 28, or you don't think, you know, you think you're 
older. Oh, I thought I was so old. Here. I thought I missed the boat. Yeah. <laughs> but you've got everything that people talk about these days, you know, in the big rah-rah stuff of, you know, create your vision board and the yachts and, you know, the the view and all the rest of it. And from such a young age, you're going, but I'm not happy with this. Mm-hmm wasn't happy, was not fulfilled, felt a little bit empty inside. And that's where the adventuring started to begin. You know, I I stepped onto the spiritual path. And as you know, it's not easy. You know, if I I had to go back and do it all over again, I might have just stayed in the blissful ignorance that I was living in, Kay. Because in those first 25, 28 years, I was blissfully ignorant and was just living life and was having, you know, was very content. But then when I shifted and started reading about spirituality and really started to discover a different part of myself, that's where the real living started. And um, I started to realize this is this world is way more than they've been telling us. And I just started to, to s- seek questions, ask questions, and kind of break away from the norms of society, I guess. I don't mean to be an outlier, but I just had, I just kind of have become one over the years. Yeah. I love that though, that, um, you know, I think questions and the right questions are so powerful. I, that, you know, when they're asked in the right way, I call them power questions because they invoke a response. Um, so from such a young age for you to be asking those power questions. And I love the fact that you say spiritual adventurer because no adventure is easy, is it? It's mm-hmm. got the challenges and, you know, it becomes the adventure because, you discover something about yourself that perhaps you didn't know, you know, that you actually had. So what a great, what a great word to associate with it. But it's, it's not this constant bliss thing. It, it takes grit. It takes courage. It takes the ability to turn that vision inwards and, and see all parts of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's been, um, it can be quite lonely sometimes because to, to, to adventure into an unknown with, which is ourselves Mm -hmm. and to ask the questions that are not easily answered, it does take courage. And that is one thing I don't have fear. I don't have a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I don't have, I mean, I'm a professional skydiver. I've been jumping out of planes since 1994, same year I started practicing yoga. Wow. Um, jumped off a bridge, like just don't have a lot of that fear. Um, but having the courage to kind of delve into who I am, it, and it kind of separates me. It has separated me from family, from friends and my real friends who I've, you know, I've been friends with, I've been friends with my first group of friends at, in kindergarten and they're still in my life, the six of us. Wow. And I have many more friends in the years. Um, the real friends stick around, right. And they yeah. know me probably better than I know myself and they knew me through the transition. And, you know, I think they probably have a lot of opinions and think I'm some crazy, some crazy gal who's a friend of theirs, but um, yeah, it does take courage. And, but I recommend anyone to step on that path at any time. You know, it's so funny. You say I was young, but Oh God, I thought I was so old. I thought I've lived so much life. And imagine if I had found this at 15, if I had like discovered yoga, because that was part of what helped me to kind of step onto that path, you know, starting to to bring your body into a different frequency. I think my body probably got there first and then my brain, <laughs> and my spirit kind of came afterward. But yeah, I recommend anyone just start doing it. Start asking the questions, get on the path and have an adventure yourself. You're never too old. That's for sure. And I, I just love hearing that you've had some core friendships from so oh, far wow. back that just mm-hmm. remain so oh. at what what were they thinking about? Were you talking about, hey, I'm sort of doing this spiritual exploration and they just oh, love yeah. you enough unconditionally to go, okay, just maybe another crazy bow to your arrow or arrow to your bow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think that back then, this is in the 90s, um, my, all my girlfriends back then were doing what everyone else was doing. They got married very young and mm-hmm. started having beautiful kids. And um, I was the adventurer. So we would always go out when I lived in in New Hampshire, every Monday we would go out and that was their, that was their way to get out and put the diapers down and just get some, some girl time. And sometimes they couldn't go because their kids were sick or something was going on. Uh Then when I moved away 
And, you know, I went traveling and I lived in Peru and I was a skydiver. I would come home and they were just, they couldn't wait to get the, get the scoop or who am I dating? Right. Cause I was always dating different people. They were, I still have friends that are married to their first, their first guy. It's really wow. sweet and amazing. Yeah. And I'm very yeah. envious in some way, again, that I'm not more normal. Um, I mean, I wouldn't trade this for the world, but it's, it's sometimes but, I'm like, but oh, what is normal? Like, Tara, you know, you're being you're being normal in the sense of true to your authentic expression mm. of the soul and energy yeah. and essence that you are. Um, it's, it's not normal to to try to adapt ourselves to fit in with what is perceived as yeah. normal. I think you're just your beautiful, the way I say about myself, eclectic self. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Were yeah. you always I mean, like that as a child? No, like I said, I was so normal. I was a very, I was just like any other kid growing up. Nothing, it didn't change until I consciously made the choice to step on that path. And I think what was the first book I read? Oh, um, it was it was about a, a woman in Australia. It was, um, what was that story she went to talk about um, with the indigenous? Oh, it, I'll remember it. Oh, that was yeah. my very first book. Yeah book you know what I mean it was a famous book way back in the 80s and 90s yeah. and then the second book was the Celestine Prophecy and okay. that just yeah opened, I just remember opening up my I'm reading I had to like check I had to check some words in the dictionary what they meant yeah. and I just was fascinated oh and then the internet I remember do you remember uh -huh. when AOL first came out and you'd log on and that sound the beep boop, beep and I was oh, like, yes. oh, I was waiting and back then you had columns that you could look up and the very, and I would always go to spirituality okay, because that was so fascinating to me. And so I think all of that just kind of, all of that culminated to making me make a right turn or a left turn or a different turn away from whatever was normal for me at the time. So people usually say, Tara, that there are either two ways that you awaken. It just sort of happens mm. and it's gradual or there's a, there's some, horrible event or challenging event that happens was there a challenging event or for you it really was just it just sort of started to happen like a flower opening up it just started to happen yeah it was kind of like an unfolding I guess you could say um but also there was some trauma and you know interestingly I'm one of those people oh, I used to make fun of people like me this is why you should never do this <laughs> um I remember watching Oprah Winfrey once way back in the day because I used to love her. And it was a, there was someone on her show who was talking about she had been molested when she was younger and she yeah. didn't remember it. And she was in her 40s. I remember going, I was scoffing. I'm like, how can you not remember something so traumatic? Well, I was one of those many people. You know, unfortunately, my story is very common and yeah. not, not, not an outlier in that respect. And but I didn't. I didn't let it in. I didn't let it into my consciousness until uh -huh. very late. And I even had shamans. I had healers telling me that things had happened when I was younger. And I just, I eschewed it. I'm like, no, absolutely not. Yeah. So there was trauma that kept me from realizing the truth. And now I've, I've dealt with that. I've worked with it. Are we ever completely healed? I don't know, but functioning totally fine. And it's okay now to talk about it. And I, I didn't talk about it for a long time. But no, I think the unfolding was just, it just came very naturally. And it was like an addiction, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, how much better can I get? Yeah. How, much, how, how much more can I clear? Um, if there's something in me that's blocking my growth, I'm like, I think you and I, didn't we talk about this? Like, get it out, rip it out of me. I just, I want to, I want to be the best potential of who I can be in this lifetime. And I don't even think I've come close to that yet. Well, yeah, I think we talked about that as well, which means, you know, when you when you reach that, well, why do you need to be in this physical form? But I want to talk about in, in the terms of healing because this is, a, this is a fascinating place that we sit spiritually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, we're not broken, Tara. This is the way that I see it. We are not broken. We mm -hmm. just have these perceptions, experiences, how we've um, taken them in, where we've let them sit. But does that make it like, so healing's interesting because I'm I'm a shamanic healer, but I also right. say to people that you're not broken. Do you mm. know what I mean? That it's just that, that um, as you said it so beautifully, here, let me put my glasses on, you know, mistruths. 
Now that mm-hmm. doesn't take away from the experience, but it's how we, you know, how we received, perceived, experienced that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for example, like a mistruth, um, and I think omitting something is being is a mistruth. Um, how many times have we said, oh, if we had just learned that in kindergarten, I mean, I say this all the time, yeah. if they had just taught us how to reconcile with someone who doesn't agree with you or taught you the importance of the law of attraction. I mean, imagine if we didn't have to wait until we were an adult to learn this stuff. I think these things and so many more should be part of a curriculum. And we should start teaching children the how amazing they are when they're young. But in yeah. America and probably in Australia and just about everywhere else in the world, we, we're in, involved in this, in, in America anyway, this very Rockefeller-ish type of uh, education where we're not taught to expand our minds and our spirits. We're taught to sit down, stay quiet, and to memorize. And it cuts off yeah. a part of our brain. And they've taught us to be very left-brained here in America and not not giving us credit for the right brain part of yeah. And both very important, very balanced. I'm much more right-brained, unfortunately. I could use a little bit more on the left. But <laughs> yeah, just those kind of mistruths. You know, I feel yeah. like the older you get, and it's, I think John Lennon said, the older I get, the wiser I get, the more confused I am. So I think that shows that we're on the right path. Because, I mean, I know a lot more than I did when I was younger, but I still yeah. feel really humble and really vulnerable and really curious about what's next. Do, do you feel though, because, you know, I was one of those women as well growing up and, you know, I can, I'm as good as the boys are and, you know, always proving myself and I'm as strong and I'm this and I'm that. But I realized that when I let a lot of that go and what it was masking, when I began to own my vulnerability as a strength, I found freedom in that. Did that happen for you? That's another great example of what I'm talking about, because up until even at 28 years old, I thought that giving my boyfriend the silent treatment for three days was strength. Yeah. I thought I was being strong and the longer I could hold that, I really, truly did. Yeah. Whereas I learned later, unfortunately, it cost me my relationship, rightly so, and I don't blame him one bit. Yeah. Um, if we had been taught at a very young age that to be vulnerable is actually the real strength. I mean, yes. how powerful is that? Now I understand that. Now I'm always the first one to apologize because, you know, people have a hard time with that, by the way. And realizing that that being vulnerable is actually very helpful when it comes to reconciliation or, mm-hmm. you know, creating peace in something or just, you know, getting along with someone. So, yeah, I definitely learned that. And um, I wish I, someone had taught me that much, much younger. That saved myself a lot of grief. That's so powerful, but you know, we're the adventurers. So, you know, we come in as souls. I think from a very young age, we, we know that connectedness from the internal and the external world. I watch my grandchildren, you know, at play and it's one world for them. And then I think the adventure is when, you know, when we start to forget that and experience just the external, and then it's that coming back, you know, and as you say that learning that vulnerability, um, it's, it's just part of the adventure and the journey. Do you think? It is part of the adventure. And another thing for me that was part of the adventure, um, a big part of my adventure was leaving home, uh-huh. was not staying in my hometown. And because when you're in your hometown, I think generally speaking, maybe not for everyone, but I know, like, sometimes I, I wonder, and I'll do a split screen of if I'd stayed back home, I think I'd probably be two times or maybe more divorced. I think I would have nice. kept emulating my, who my mother was, and which yeah. is fine. But, you know, I'm not my mother. And it took me leaving home and not being surrounded by so many people who've known me since birth, expecting me to be a certain way, because this is, is what happens when you just stay close to yes. home. Yeah. I got to leave and go become who I was meant to be. And some of the foundational pieces I took from my mom and dad, but I, I wasn't building the same house anymore, which is what I think I would have done had I stayed home. So leaving gave me the freedom to adventure and realize and wonder, well, who am I without the influence of my parents? Because, you know, I was emulating my mom a lot, especially in relationships. And I don't want to do that love my mom, but I don't want what she had. And I don't, so I had to leave. I had to leave in order to 
that to is discover that. So powerful because we do find that there are these threads where you know, when you've been in a place for a long time and had those depths of connection, people don't want you to change because then it sort of unsettles the field that they're on. So I'm, I'm really there with you. Sometimes you just need to get up and and go somewhere else. and Where people don't know you and are expecting you to be a certain way and you yeah. can be whomever you're meant to be. It's very freeing. I mean, I, I've... In fact, I even had someone read to me. It was a, she was some kind of a, an intuitive. Yeah. And she said to me, she said, I see two parts of your life. And had you stayed where you were, you would be miserable and you'd be bitter. And I was like, oh my gosh. And this woman, she had never met me before. And I said, I 100% believe that. So I'm really grateful that I did have the courage to move. And I went to become a professional skydiver. That's that was the impetus, and to yeah. go and live with that boyfriend who later on broke up with yeah. me and gave me the greatest gift, which is heartache. Heartache, actually, believe it or not, one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. Yeah, I can say that now. <laughs> yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When you can sort of look back and start finding the gifts in situations. Do Do you feel because you're on Inner Voice of Knowing podcast? Do you feel that you had? Was it an inner voice guiding you? What? How do you sort of look at that? I mean, not everyone wants to pick themselves up, take themselves, you know, away from all things familiar to recreate themselves. What? What was the? Was was there were were there a few threads that were driving you? Was it an inner voice, or you know, as lot some people like to call it intuition? What was it for you? At the time, I didn't know what I was walking into. I didn't know that I was going to go and change my life and become who I was meant to be. I had no clue. It was skydiving. That was the addiction of um, free falling um, yeah. and to move to Florida because in New Hampshire, and you know, you can't jump for six, seven months out of the year. It's too cold. And and my boyfriend, who I was in love with, lived in Florida. He was a skydiver. So yeah. it was just, it was so easy to make that switch and to, plus to be in the warmth versus the winter, you know, six yep. months out of the year. I mean, it's really easy. And um, I thought I was moving to Florida to be with him the rest of my life. And then we ended up breaking up a year later and that's where everything just cracked wide open. That's why I'm saying the, the gift of heartbreak Yeah, with that is probably the biggest pivot and the biggest gift I could have ever been given. And because I had already stepped on this path and was becoming aware of my spirituality and my connection, I was very conscious through the whole breakup. I even knew, I actually forced him to tell me he didn't love me. I needed him to tell me. Yeah. And the moment he did that, we were standing in the frame of a door from our bedroom to the living room. My heart did two things. It broke, but it also grew wings. I could feel it. Ooh, shoot. The free yeah, the freedom he gave me by telling me the truth. Yes. Because I had been doing um, chakra work that year. And I think I was working on my fifth chakra. And um, that's the year truth became so paramount in my life. And it continues to be. Um, I think that's where I get the whole, like, just rip it off of me. Like, tell me yeah. the truth. Yeah. That I can find the freedom. Because I was being held in a place that wasn't true with him because he wasn't telling me the truth. So that was a really powerful point in my life. And from there, um, began to heal. That is and that was so powerful though, isn't it? I always say, you know, things are like a double-edged sword. Oh, and yeah. I think you've just shared something incredibly powerful. And that is that as your heart broke, it also grew wings. Mm -hmm. And I Absolutely. think that's the paradox at times, you know, and yeah. is the breaking the cracking open so the wings can can come out. And and yeah. um, what is free falling like, literally? Because we'll talk about things like that spiritually, but you've actually, you know, yeah. you've done it, yeah, for real, literal and figurative free faller. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, talk about freedom. So there's one thing with me as well, and I've had this is so fun when you have someone acknowledge something that you've known to be innately true, but there's mm. nothing that I can prove. But freedom has been such a massive part of my upbringing. Even the school I went to when I was younger, um, they gave us the freedom to come and go as we please, which was really different for, for other people wow. going to school. Um, the church I went to was Protestant. It was very freeing. It was very fun. It was very jo joyous, a lot of laughing, a lot of joking. Yeah. Um, 
I had parents that gave me a lot of freedom. I was the youngest of three. So there was a lot of freedom. So freedom is probably one of the most important things in my life. And I had a chart. My chart was read one year, years ago, an astrology chart. And this person said, boy, freedom is really important to you. And I was like, oh, thank you. They said, oh, it's everywhere in your chart. So freedom is the most important value to me mm. because it, it brings you truth. You know, truth and freedom go hand in hand to me. So um, having the freedom to do what is important to me probably comes first in everything, which is probably why I'm still single. I'm still doing my own thing. Um, that's another thing I'm kind of, I kind of wish I was normal. I wish I could just like settle down and just be happy like everyone else is. But, but you know, maybe maybe that. Tara, you'll you'll bring in the relationship that honors your freedom. Do you know what I mean? That respects your freedom, that celebrates your your free spirit. Um, and I think that's I have, the thing. I have that on my life. Hey, free spirit. And when people see me and in, in, like, in, you know, it's like, oh, I love your license plate. And I'm like, it's not just a license plate. <laughs> yeah. It's not just a bunch of letters on the license plate. <laughs> yeah. So you've, you've I've clearly got to a natural independence and, and you know, the, the hierarchy of your value is is that freedom and that freedom to be you and to crack open and to to spread your wings. But that does not mean that you can't have a loving relationship. You know, mm -hmm. we're always breaking these. I, I think I said to you in the interviews, you know, truth is beyond the shadow of the belief system and we're always figuring out, God, is that just another belief system that I have? You know, yeah, right. I'm, I'm walking the Camino in the new year and everyone's like, oh, so your husband's going with you? And I went, no, he's got absolutely no interest. He's so excited for me to go, but how long will you be gone? Six weeks. Oh, yeah. awesome. but he's so excited. But I could not be with somebody that wouldn't give me the freedom to be me or celebrate right. when I make a choice. And I think that's the thing that the best relationships regardless of what the package looks like are when you're not needy on each other. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, someone framed it for me differently. I've been single for a long time. And he said, that is so amazing. He was like, instead of being like, Oh, you poor thing. He was like, you know how much, you know how much grief you've like moved yeah. around and you didn't have to go through by being with the wrong person. And I was like, I love how you just reframed that. I'm going to, yes. I'm going to look at it that way. And the yeah. fact is, it's just, it's just my life. This is just what it is. And, you know, this, I know a lot of people who've been together for a long time who maybe aren't, aren't as happy. So I'd rather be single and alone for now than miserable with the wrong person. And um, I know there's a, there's a match for me out there. So luckily for me, it's not the most important thing. I can be very happy and independent on my own. I have a very rich life. I have a lot of wonderful people around me. I have animals. I have live I in beautiful places. I think that's places, what's really so. powerful though, Tara. Do you know what I mean? When I know that uh, I was in, you know, my first marriage and a 14 year relationship and three kids and you don't leave lightly. And when I did, I decided that I would not be intimate with anybody for a certain length of time, that I would just get to know me, date me. And three years, I coined the phrase born again, virgin, right? Because <laughs> I was <laughs> just not, but what I learned was, I think what you're living, which is, you know what? I'm great company. I'm really mm -hmm. happy with who I am. I'm happy with my life. I feel like there's this great relationship there. But if that never happens, I'm good. I feel like you're saying you're in that place. I'm good. And a relationship mm -hmm. can come along, but that won't make me feel whole. I'm already feeling whole. Well, I think the mistake that people make is thinking that we get married so that someone else can complete us. Yeah. And that's not um, that's not how it goes. So yeah. we need to be happy within ourselves. I would love to have someone walk along with me and share the path and add yeah. to it and someone to lean on and, and all that stuff. But at the same time, I'm fiercely independent. Like I was in bed last night and, you know, I've unfortunately trained myself to like fall asleep to a podcast. And I was thinking, gee, what would I be doing if well, I'd probably be having a lot more fun if there's a guy <laughs> laying next to me right now? Um, how am I going to, how am I going to go to sleep? How am I going to sleep with a man snoring? I can't even, I, I, I can't even, when my cat purrs, I wake up. I'm such a light sleeper. So yeah. I do wonder about all these because it's been so long, but I think when it's the right person and I do believe that 
it's it's going to happen. I'm not I'm not at all worried about it. And people stop asking. At some point, they stopped asking. My mom and dad used to always say, like, so when do you think? You know? And I would be like, after a while, they just stopped asking. So oh no, I f- I feel know. it there for you. When did you when did you on this journey of yours and this adventure um, feel drawn to becoming a life coach? And why why life coaching? Complete accident. It was 2004. <laughs> uh, I was living with another boyfriend who was a skydiver and I was a professional skydiver at the time. And I was on, on the internet and I remember, I don't know what I was on, but seeing something about coaching. Mm-hmm. Well, my boyfriend uh, was a world champion and uh, for the UK team. And I thought, oh, coaching, you know, cause he was a coach, he was a skydiving coach. And I thought, oh, so I clicked on it for Steve, not for me. And it was something about life coaching in 2004. I mean, no one knew what the heck, I didn't know what it was. I'm like, life coaching. And I started reading about it and it just, it spoke to me and I loved the thought of it and the idea of it. And it was a, it was a school called IPEC. And I thought about it and I talked to some friends and people and I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. I think it was like $5,000, which was Mm -hmm. a lot of money for me back then. Yeah. And I, I, I started this amazing course and that is another huge part of my life that even if I never utilized the, the coaching and had clients, it was the most life altering experience. It was wonderful. The whole process really went along well with the spirituality because the school that I, cho- I happened to choose just the right school that aligned with my values. And I think that's so important. Yeah. So yeah, I became a certified life coach in 2004, back when you know, I was always ahead. I was always like this weird, I was a vegan in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Back when veganism, was, it was weird. I was into yeah. some weird shit back then. That's what people would say. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was a yoga teacher in the 90s. Like people like, you can make money teaching yoga and now you can't turn around without seeing yoga somewhere. Yeah. I was always kind of leaning into the future a little bit. And it was the same with life coaching. I don't know why. I don't know why I suddenly get involved with something that really becomes like going to Peru and doing plant medicine. Yeah. No one knew what I was in the 90s. Yeah. Now look at it like an everyday common word for most people. So but you, you, this gets presented. And as you said, $5,000 back then is a lot of money. What what made you go, but I'm going to invest that in myself? I just knew reading about it. I was like, oh, this isn't for him. This is for me. Yeah. Because I was always that person. I was that person that people would come to and they'd sit and I would be, I would be the the person to give them advice or to listen. Yeah. And I was a good listener, but not nearly as good as I became because the school taught me the three levels of listening and how powerful that is. And as a coach, as you know, there's nothing more important and there's no greater gift to give anyone, not just your clients, is the gift of real deep level listening. And that that has improved every relationship. It's improved my careers and sales. It's improved everything. Yeah. So yeah, becoming a life coach was the greatest, greatest thing I could have done for sure. And then into broadcasting. So yeah. you're, you know, you're a guest co-host for Spiritually Raw, uh, which mm-hmm. is also connected to Gnostic TV and, right. you know, your own podcast. Yeah. Again, just n- no intention. Just, um, in fact, the, the, the creators of Spiritually Raw, Jay and April, they were my mentors. They're the ones who kind of pushed me along and mm-hmm. got me to do my podcast. It took a lot of courage. That's another thing that, that yeah. I was a little bit worried. Cause you know, you don't want to, you don't want to look like a jerk or sound stupid, but the fact is you just have to, you have to get out there. And I thought, well, I, I apparently have something to say. So um, I named my podcast sacred Valley because I lived in the sacred Valley of Peru and mm-hmm. through all of my trials and tribulations there, I learned we all have a very, very sacred Valley within ourselves. And that's where yeah. the good stuff happens. That's where the deep connections happen. And that's where the, the wisdom lies. So yeah, I started doing my podcast. I think it's going to be, I think it was 20, 2021. So I'm going on mm-hmm. three years and I still don't really know where I'm going with it. I'm just having fun with it. And, but then, you know, Jane April asked me to, to guest co-host, which was a complete honor for them. So wow. I'm just having fun and I get to meet really great people like you and so many other people who've come along. Beautiful. So, oh, if you could have one great gem to pull from your journey and your your pouch of wisdom from all these experiences, what 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 is it that you really want to say and share? Boy, that's such a good question. 
I don't know if this is something innate in me, but I would just say, I think your attitude is absolutely everything in yeah. life. Um, I think I would take the way that I took my heartbreak, the the the, the most difficult thing that I, I've ever gone through. And I actually did not think I was going to live through, to be honest with you. I really, and in fact, I don't think I would have lived because I think the darkness would have enveloped me. And I think I would have gotten sick or left this plane, not, not yeah. consciously, not, not knowingly. Yeah to be aware of everything that's going on and just to be open to the truth all the time, even if it's painful and to have that courage and to know that, okay, I'm going through some darkness and I've gotten to the point now, okay, where I, when I'm in a valley and yeah. I am in a valley right now to go, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Deepak Chopra says it in one of his books, when you find yourself in the mystery, mm -hmm, that's where we should feel the most comfortable because it's from whence we came. We all come from the mystery. We don't know where we came from. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going. I think I have an idea. I hope I know where I'm going, but I don't know what happens when we die. I don't know where I was before yeah. I was born. And uh, when you're in that darkness, and again, a wonderful thing to have been taught when we're little, right? To yeah. teach us, you know, when you're in that darkness, why don't you just embrace it and say, thank you, God for the, the gems that are there are to come, because I guarantee you when you're in a valley in life, that is where the gold is. And now I'm conditioned to thank God for the valleys and to be like, okay, here we go. Thank yeah. you. Get your notepad out, take some really good notes because you're, you're in for some really good stuff. It's beautiful. So I, I always call it like the void or the womb. You know, yes. that when life is created, yeah, where it's shaped and formed and and then you birth. And so, you know, I have certain tools that that when I'm taken into that place and I find that I've been doing this for, God, over three decades, nearly four decades now that it's faster. And there's a, there's a piece when it happens as much as it can also feel tumultuous. It's like that duality, that double-edged sword. But I have certain things that I draw on and, and, you know, one of them for me is is just that, you know, the, that hand on heart and breathing and always the love, compassion, understanding and forgiveness, even if I don't know what that is at the time or how I'm going to do know. that. But it it brings me in the now moment. What it, What is one tool that's in your tool belt? Um, and it might just be that thank you, thank you, thank you that, that you were saying that, you know, you feel is that one go to for anyone that's listening, that's going through heartbreak or the the challenge or, you know, in that valley, as you say, and they just need one thing. You don't throw, you know, a whole tool belt at someone in that space. Sometimes no. it's just what's one thing I can do that will help me breathe and move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I think probably like you, I don't believe in quantum leaping when it comes to like working with a client. Can, can it happen? Does it happen? Yes. Can you do a complete 180 degree miracle shift? Sure. But for me, yeah, I, I really do. Just imagine if we had been taught since you were little, when you're when you're in that moment, where you're crying, you're so upset because a child took a toy from you or whatever it is that's setting you to say, you know what? thank you for this. Cause I'm going to learn something from it. And it's, it's so anathema to what we've been taught. Why would we thank God for something awful happening? Mm. But if you're willing to seek the silver lining, there is one in everything. I, I, I believe it. And yeah. I, I've been through enough of them to know. Yeah. So it's the hardest thing to do, but if you can find a, a quiet place, a heartfelt place to say to God, I don't understand this. I don't understand this darkness that I'm in right now, mm -hmm. but I trust you. And I've been through enough of these to know that yeah. if I'm open enough, I'm going to find what's good and what's healthy and what's going to lead me out of this darkness. And Rumi, another, my favorite poet yeah. from Persia yeah. says, um, I will use darkness to light. I will use darkness to light my way. So let the darkness lead you to the light. Mm. And I think that, being grateful and having yeah. gratitude to something that we don't even know what's going on is extremely powerful. So beautifully and powerfully said, Tara. And, and for me, sometimes they're the quantum leaps. I think quantum leap gets thrown around in a way yeah. that 
you know, it's a little bit like when something comes up that you've been working towards and it comes up and it doesn't seem the right time or the, you know, in the right way, or but it is that quantum leap for me, which I feel is different to what a lot of people say, is that dig deep. Like you're saying in that valley moment, that's the quantum leap. Just draw on one thing that starts to bring you out to yeah. the other side, perhaps. No, no, I think you're right because what I'm talking about doing yeah. is massive. It's really major and it has such an um such an an opportunity to shift you into yeah. a completely different space. But yeah. once you get the hang of it and you start getting the gems of that gratitude and you start to realize, wow, because you know what it does? It takes you out of victimhood. Mm. It's, it, it takes you out of self-pity. Yeah. And and it, it humbles you. It's It really envelops all the things we've been talking about, the vulnerability. Talk about being vulnerable yeah. to the darkness where what you just want to do is curl up in a ball and, and wait till it goes away. But if you engage with it and you realize this is this could be a gift, what if this is the greatest gift that has ever been given to me? Mm. You don't want to shun it. You don't want to eschew it. You want it. You want to invite it in. You want to have a cup of tea with it and say, <laughs> Okay. And I'm just like a digger. I'm like, okay, where is it? Where's the good stuff? Where's the silver lining? I know you're in here. I know you're in here somewhere because I've been through enough of them. And that attitude now, I am in a valley. It changes the whole thing. So now I don't go into a deep, dark depression. I'm like, okay, like splunking, you know, you put your little light on and you're like, okay, where is it? Where's the good stuff? So I'm hearing you say like, be real with it, but um, draw on what moves you through it. And I remember that, um, Oh, it might have been last year now, I can't recall, but something really challenged me and took me into this place. And I've got the, you know, the metal blind that comes down on the bedroom and I, I chose to spend the day in there. And mm -hmm. I cried and in between letting the grief go, it was love, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, come on. And then there was a call to a friend where I said, I feel like I'm drowning, knowing that I won't. I feel like I'm drowning can I come see you Monday for a session? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, okay. So all those things, knowing that I was doing the journey, even though the journey felt dark and deep and emotional, mm -hmm. there's the other part that's doing my breathing. Let me call out for help and be real to say, I'm, I'm, I'm drowning in this moment. So I need, I need life saver. Yeah. Yeah. Life and saver. It, it just travels side by side. There's no question. And and what I'm not saying is, you know, be gleeful, be happy. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I know it seems like I am, but because I think I have kind of conditioned myself to have that attitude of like, okay, this one's a good one. You know, what are you going to bring me? But um, it doesn't mean you can't feel scared. It doesn't mean you can't reach for help. You know, I, I would say, tapping into that innate part of yourself is going to lead you to the truth. What do you need in, in this moment? Yeah. Is it calling out? Something? Yeah. Is it, is it being alone? Is it crawling up? Is yeah. it crying for the day? Um, but all the while knowing that you're not alone, that we have prime creator source, whatever word you want to ascribe to yeah. it. And I think when we're in those moments, that's where we forget that we have that connection. That's where we feel the most alone. Cause we're yeah. in the dark, right? In yeah. The darkness. We're in the womb. Yeah, but look what happens when we're born, and and the truth comes. So, um, yeah, I think be authentic with yourself, be truthful, and be open, but also have a tinge of gratitude. It's, yeah. it's magic. And you know that joy that you're talking about, because I get very excited <laughs> when these moments come up too. Even yeah. if I'm like, oh, breakdown, breakthrough sort of mode, there's a part yeah. of me because I've done this, you know, for um, nearly forty years personally. That there is, and it's okay at the very core where we are not broken to go, here we go again. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah. Another valley. And there's a part of me that feels like, you know, let's say if you're in a certain position in your life and there's something, let's say there's something you don't like. I don't know. Let's say mm -hmm. if you're not, you don't have as much money or if you're not in a very good relationship or you're at a job that you don't like. There is a part of you that is enjoying it. And that's really hard. I, and yeah. I work with my clients about this. And I'm like, okay, so you're telling me you, you really hate this job. But what is it that's making you stay? 
if it's that bad, why aren't you leaving? There's something, there, yeah. you're getting something out of it. There is this part of you that's getting something out of this. What is it? What's, what are you getting out of this? And it makes people think. And then that helps them realize, wow, there is something I'm getting out of it. Or they realize I can change this. I can take responsibility and let go of it and move on to something else. And that's, that takes a lot of courage to be honest with you. And that truth, as you said so beautifully before, does it cracks you open, but it gives you your wings. That's the freedom. Mm -hmm. That's that point of freedom. Um, because mm-hmm. I'm the same way too. You know, I've even had clients, I don't want to do this anger anymore. Well, you sort of do because, you you know, it's a bit like we get to do something. We may not like it, but I know how to do this so well. I don't know how to do the other side of this. But when you find, you know, what the payoff is, there's there's the break the chain moment. There's the freedom. Yeah. But as you yeah. say, it takes it takes that, that courage and you need a solid guide, you know, such as yourself that knows that terrain that says, hey, you're going to do this, but I can show you the way. I, I understand how to navigate this. And, you know, I've been through so many of these and I think that you are the same. You're very, I believe you when you speak, you have a, a certain frequency in your voice that resonates with me. And I'm speaking the truth, my truth, you know, truth yeah. with a capital T. I don't believe on this planet there are, there is a truth because who is the, who is the arbiter of that? Who draws that line? I think we all have to draw our own line of truth and your truth might be in a different place than mine. That's the beauty of having free will and being human on this planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like not finding out what your personal truth is, that would, that makes me sad. That would, that would, that would, you know, dying with their song in them. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything more sad than that to me. And I don't even know if I know my truth is yet. I think I'm still discovering it. I'm still trying to figure that out. Well, I feel like, you know, I know what I know, but I know nothing at all. And I'm, 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 I'm like you, I'm a truth seeker and a truth speaker, but I'm also then willing to let, let elements of that go when I go, well, th- that actually maybe was it was my truth at the time from how I stood it to be. But then I realized it was also another layer of a belief system. Right. And Absolutely. I feel like it's like moving towards that central point. And it doesn't make us wrong when we were out here. That's what I knew at that time and understood at that time. But don't hold on to it so tightly. Allow it to continue to mm. to unfold if it needs to. Absolutely. And as you so beautifully say, that's part of the adventure. Yeah, let that um that reminds me of the word surrender, right? And yeah. it's so important all yeah. of this to and that's hard for us surrendering because that's letting go. It's uh, there's a lot of a lot of trust that goes on in that. There's a lot of faith that if by letting go of something, whether it be a poor relationship, a job, yeah. that something else and something better will come in, something more realistic to align with who you are now. Like you were just saying, you know, we change over the years. I've you know how many times I've changed belief systems, and that's not normal. Yeah. Our belief systems are our bedrock. I mean, for for some people, if you take away their belief system, some people can't survive it. I've changed belief systems multiple times, and I'll probably do it again. It's painful. It's a little bit painful, but so worth it. It's worth it versus carrying around the ball and change of some chain of some belief system that doesn't suit me any longer. I can't do that. I'm so, I'm so authentic to the core and to, to a fault um, that I just have to be who I am now. I've, I've learned that it's, it's, it's beneficial. It also means that you might lose some people, you know, along the way, how many people have you lost over the years on the spiritual path? You do lose people because you're not freak. I call it frequency specific. I use that a lot. Yeah. If you're not yeah. frequency specific with them anymore, they're not in your lives anymore. And that can be scary for some people. They don't, they want the same people around them for whatever reason. So to hold, to hold yeah. the same story, to hold the same story. Yeah. Well, and yeah. And for some Eckhart Tolle calls it the pain body, right. To stay yeah. in that pain body. It's familiar. And even the old and crappy <laughs> feels yeah. familiar and oh so much God. better than unknown. Tara, I could I could just keep talking to you. I wish we didn't have the oceans between us, and we could we could. I know. I want to have a cup of tea. And, but who's who's the next version of yourself that you feel like you're being called to become? Let's finish on that one. Wow, such another great question. A wiser, 
even more compassionate woman than I have become. Mm -hmm. And I'm on a journey right now. I'm in a very, I'm in a valley and I'm excited about it. And um, it, it took me a couple of weeks to get excited about it, but I'm, I'm excited. Okay. And um, I'm, I'm excited to grow again. Cause like I was just saying, I kind of walk my talk as a life coach. You have to, yeah. and um, I can't give you the advice to embrace the darkness, but not do it myself. Yeah. So um, I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing it for the people I know I'm going to help in the future. And um I think that I have another major uh, shift coming in terms of my belief systems. I think I'm going to have a little whack upside the head, which is good because then it just shakes the, it shakes everything off that I've learned over the years that doesn't serve me anymore. And so I'm hoping just to become a more truthful, honest, authentic person of myself, like a version of myself. I can feel it coming. I, I know this feeling. I've been through this before, so I can, I can yeah. it's recognizable. <laughs> yeah. I'm very particular about who I collaborate with, who I invite onto the podcast and, you know, because it's a reflection of my work, the brand that I am, um, what I'm about and all I've ever felt and heard and witnessed from you in our three interactions is that absolute stake in the ground that I have to walk this, I have to do this, I have to apply this to become this. And I mm -hmm. honour you for that, um, Tara. You're more mm -hmm. than you realise yourself to be and you are definitely here for, for a um, transformative purpose, not just for yourself but for those around you. And I thank you so much for the two interviews that you've had me on and for being here today for this one, but more so for speaking openly and honestly about yourself and your journey and your spirituality and your life, because I know it's going to, it's going to land well for a lot of listeners. So bless you and thank you. Oh, I can't thank you for having me. I love these conversations. So thank you everyone and have a happy Christmas yeah. and a wonderful new year. And here's to, here's to a brand new year. Let's see what we can create. Beautiful. Join me on my next episode. And if you love this podcast, please subscribe by clicking on the plus button. If you're on Apple or like, and follow on Spotify, rate and review, and please share in a voice of knowing with your friends.